My name is Darren Deaton. I'm a doctor of physical therapy. I've been practicing about 27 years. Um, but it's, I'm a starting strength coach. I'm also, in our profession, you can be board certified. I'm a board certified orthopedic specialist. Um, and I own four physical therapy clinics. Been in business ownership for my entire practice life, except for one year. And we have um, also one gym left. I had three gyms and I just sold two CrossFit gyms. Yes. And I have one left and that's eventually gonna be converted uh, to something different, so. But um, this talk that I'm gonna do today is something that I'm very familiar with. I hope it uh, seems fairly natural because it's something we do every single day, using the barbell in the clinic. Now, this has been a, a gradual conversion over time. Introducing a barbell and a rack into a physical therapy clinic with therapists that really have no experience whatsoever with iron, with the barbell. And so I, the first clinic I put a barbell rack in was my home clinic that I, it was the original clinic that we built. And I, I put the rack in in an evening. We came in and we installed it. It's a wall mounted rack. And the next day the two therapists walked in and they were like, what's that for? I said, it's for lifting. They're like, well, what for? For our patients. We're gonna use it to, to rehab our patients. They're like, our patients can't do that. So th therein started the journey, right? To try to reshape their mindset and what their perception is of what we can do with our patient population. So we're gonna go through some talking points first and then after that I'm gonna share some cases with you where we've used the barbell movements, the starting strength barbell movements to, um, and the method to rehab our patients. So basically all the barbell lifts that we perform in the clinic use the starting strength barbell method. We use the squat, the press, the deadlift, the bench press, the power clean with some clients that are more athletically based, younger clients or clients that want to develop power. The assistive lifts, the chin up, push up, RDLs, lat pull downs, the barbell row, and the ring presses uh, that Rip created. We use that almost every single day. I, th I think I do use it every single day with our shoulder patient population. And then the leg press, we do not have one yet, but that is the next purchase for the clinics. It's a typical setup in one of our satellite clinics. It's got a rogue folding rack, rings, PVC to start with overhead shoulder mobility work and shoulder press work, bumper plates, and two bar there's two barbells there. There's a 25 pound barbell and a 45 pound barbell. We also have a 35 pound barbell and a 12 and a half pound technique bar too. So here are some reasons why medical professionals don't use, or PTs in particular, don't use the barbell movements in a clinical setting. Number one, and plain and simple, they're, they're afraid of its use. They really don't understand. And I put in here, they have the TDK syndrome, which is they just don't know. They don't know. And um, it's, it's surprising to me, and I'll show you an example later in this talk, of a DPT that came to me that's in a sports medicine fellowship. And you know why she came to me? Because she wanted to learn to squat. She's in a sports medicine fellowship. She already has her DPT. She's been practicing three years. And she's in one of the top ranked sports medicine fellowships in the South. And she needed to come to someone to learn to squat. I'll show you that case later. The second thing is um, some, some PTs see the barbell as being something that might violate their standard of practice. It may, you know, it's limited by the perception that barbell movements should not be used in a clinical setting. I can tell you that the first time I told a physician that I was using a 45 pound barbell to rehab his post-op rotator cuff patient and do overhead presses, he, you know, he got a little uh, miffed by it, you know. He, he was, he was um, quite surprised. But then when he saw the overall result of what the outcome was with that particular patient, uh, he said, hey, whatever you're doing, continue to use it. Just don't hurt my patients. That was his primary thing, just don't hurt my patients. And so, um, you know, they, they don't know either. They don't, they don't know what you're doing, why you're doing it, especially if you're a PT or a medical professional or if you're a starting strength coach in a gym. They really don't understand what we do. Third thing is medical professionals, and we've all seen this, don't they? I do it myself. We like to complicate to validate. We got to make it complicated because that validates our education, the academic basis, the time that we've spent, the investment, our intellectual property, all those kinds of things. So they, they want to complicate the process and really it's, it's very simple as we all know. 
The other thing is, is that knowledge that's, have y'all found this, that knowledge that doesn't come from their own um, field of study, they have a tendency to just deny its value. You see that? You know, in other words, if it doesn't come from within inside their organization, they're probably not going to recognize it as having value. Um, I've learned that that's a big mistake. I've probably learned more about rehab from this group in here and the collective coaches in this group that I learned from my academic training. The other thing is medical professionals do not see the barbell training as a high level skill and they see it something that's kind of below their level of, of you know, it's crude. It's a barbell, it's crude, right? It's a simple tool, uh, but they see it fairly as a, as a crude tool. And then the last thing is, and probably one of the most important things that we see in our practices is, and let me just tell you about our clinics, about 30% of our population, it, they're Medicare patients. So they're 55, some of them are younger Medicare patients, but on the average 55 to 60 plus Medicare patients. About 20% of our population workers comp, work injury type patient population. The rest is commercial insurance and also private pay. So it kind of gives you a feel for everything from the youngest patient that we'll accept is um, 10 years old, because I don't want the pediatric liability, so we refer that on. And the oldest patient we'll accept is, you know, infinitum, so however old they are. But patients have a pre preconceived perception of the use of the barbell. It's heavy, it's crude, it's something that they're unfamiliar with. They associate it more with like a competitive athlete or a lifter or someone that's younger than rehab. And most of the older population, I mean, I had a, I had a patient two or three weeks ago that I started with back rehab with her. And when I told her, you'll eventually be lifting that barbell across the room and doing deadlifts, she was like, there's no way. I will never lift that barbell. And she lifted it last week. So um, she did lift it. Here are some reasons why we need to use the barbell in the clinic. Number one, it's safe, effective. It recruits the most muscle mass. It's what we all know for strength gains. And, you know, we hear this functional compound movement training within the physical therapy world. You know, you're standing on a ball while you're lifting a kettlebell, while you're swinging your arm, while you're rowing on a rower, because it's functional, right? Well, there's nothing more functional, and we know this, than using a barbell and performing compound movement with it, right? It simulates almost anything you can do in life that requires lifting or movement. And so I, I teach our PTs that if you want to do something functional, why don't you just teach them to lift an object up off the floor or pick something up out of a cupboard, a cabinet, you know, so, or get out of a chair. So the other thing is, is that we know that it makes them stronger. It makes them stronger faster than anything we can we can do and and I'm convinced now more than ever that the number one thing that a PT can do in his or her clinic is to give his or her patients strength that's the best treatment and I think you know Dr. Sullivan or Sully you know in barbell prescription he talks about strength majorly impacts everything in their endocrine system connective tissue their ability to be mobile it increases mobility everything it increases the last thing is it can be titrated and scaled and dosed to the need of any patient population. And um, then they can take it out in real life. So let's talk about what we use in the clinic. So to a lot of you, this over here rec looks like something that you would never want to do with a client because she doesn't have a barbell on the ba her back. This is a rheumatoid arthritic patient that I've been treating for about six months. She has very little hand function. Her hands are completely deformed. Her, she has knee flexion contractures in both knees. She can extend her knees to about oh, minus 20, 25 degrees of knee extension. Her feet joints are destroyed, but she's lifting a 15 pound dumbbell in a squat here. But that's her version of the squat. So my goal is to use the barbell movement with the dumbbell. Does that make sense? I can't get a barbell on her back because her arms will only go out about this far. So it just is what it is, but she's still squatting. When she came to me, she could not stand without the use of assistance. And now in about, um, I think I've had her for six months, finally worked our way up, I see her twice a week, to the dumbbell. Second patient's an ACL patient, I'll talk about her a little bit more, and then the last one was a lumbar HMP, herniated disc patient. I also use the press, we use, we use RIPS, um, ring press bar, uh, rehab movement every single day in our clinics. This is a post-op rotator cuff patient. She is two weeks post-op. 
So she's already pressing overhead. It violates the physician's protocol, so I don't let him know we do it. <laughs> um, it's kind of scary. It's kind of scary sometimes, but I haven't heard. I've been practicing 27 years, and I tell him this. You got to trust me. I've been practicing 27 years, and I've never once torn a repair of anything. Quad tendon, ACL, cuff, and I don't plan to, for you to be the first is what I tell them. The one in the middle is a female athlete using the press, and the last one is a, this gentleman had a severe shoulder dislocation that he was out for three hours in a dislocated position. So here's my rheumatoid patient again. She's on the far left, and that's her deadlift right now. She uses a wood dowel, and we perform a deadlift motion, the starting strength deadlift motion with that wood dowel right there. The gentleman in the middle is a guy who said he would never touch a barbell, so I made him start deadlifting with a kettlebell instead. So he uses a kettlebell. And then the guy on the far right, again, this is a lumbar patient that uh, basically was told he was surgical. His doctor said to never lift again. He was a CrossFitter, and he's deadlifting. So this is a young lady who's an ACL reconstruction patient. She had a um, hamstring tendon graft ACL. She's a CrossFitter. We started her with PVC and just going through the squat movement. She moved up to the bar the next visit. I had her do squats at home. The next visit, we moved her up to a 35-pound bar, and I think she squatted 125 this week for three sets of five. She's about seven weeks post-op. All right. This was my guy that the doctor said, don't ever lift anything again. He was a fairly competitive CrossFitter in his gym and local circles. And um, we started him. This was actually the progression that we did. He couldn't deadlift for a long time because it caused referral pain down his leg. So I said, all right, we're not deadlifting right now then. We just won't do that right now. So I said, what about squat? Have you tried squatting yet? He said, no, I haven't tried squatting. I said, well, let's try squatting. So we started with just air squats, sit to stands, I call them. And then from there, we went to the bar, and he just sent me a message today. They moved to Midland, and he just PR'd his back squat, lifetime PR on his back squat, okay, 315. He weighs about 165, and uh, he, he was like, I can't believe it. I just, I just PR'd my back squat. And this is a guy who they said never lift again because you're going to, you know, your back's going to break or whatever else happened. He has a huge 12-millimeter herniated disc that's compressing the nerve root. And through some other techniques, we got the compression down, we got the inflammatory process down, and then we were able to get him to start squatting and deadlifting. He doesn't CrossFit anymore. It's just too much repeated, um, uncontrolled movement. We gotta do controlled movements with him because he starts hurting if we don't. But, but look where he's at. This is my DPT that came to me and her squat on the right, we, I worked with her in the clinic and then we went to the gym this was her squat to start with. She has Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome too. She's extremely mobile. Everything's, you know, what you would call double jointed, which doesn't exist, but very hypermobile in the joint ligaments. And this was her squat once we fixed it. And then she brought her husband into me about two weeks ago and said, I want you to teach him how to lift. And so he's on a, a novice linear progression also. And then she emailed me this last week looking for a job. So it's exciting, it's exciting to see when we stick to what we know works, um, how we can use it. This is one of my most interesting cases. I, I, I'm kind of treading on some water I shouldn't hear with this patient, but this is a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. So they did a shoulder replacement, but it's a reverse. You know what I mean by that? So they've taken, instead of the humerus having a ball as the joint, and, the, and then you've got the fossa, okay, of the, uh, the um, scapular, um, the glenoid, all right, they, they flip it around. So now on her scapula, her shoulder blade, there's a ball, and on the humerus, there's a fossa. And they do that when a patient has no rotator cuff. So then they can use the deltoid as the abductor and the elevator because the, the rotator cuff is no longer gonna function, all right? So this patient is, and this may not seem like a big deal, but she's four weeks post-op. She's not supposed to be going overhead for eight to 10 weeks. She's an OT, she's an occupational therapist, and so I told her, here's the deal, we're gonna go overhead earlier, are you okay with that? I won't hurt you, I promise you. I've read all the literature, I know this will work. She was like, just do what you want. So this is where she is today. Her range of motion, expectation from her physician, get this, 
was 100 degrees. 100 degrees. Does that look like 100 degrees? This just fires me up, man. <laughs> it's just so exciting. I got goosebumps, man. It just excites me. So we're, we're using PVC right now, but she's doing presses overhead. We're going to start adding load because we are going to follow some of the physician's requirements there. I just, you know, there's some liability here that I have that you don't have. Um, and so um, we're, we're going to be careful how we progress, but no pain. There's no pain with this at all. So I'm, ex I'm excited to see what we're going to do with her. This is my best friend, one of my training partners. He was the one with the dislocation, severe dislocation. He was out for three hours. Had a brachial plexus injury too. That was last August, September. He was a member of my gym. He lifted and he crossfit. He's a light, smaller guy. And so we started pressing him. So long and short of it is, he lifetime PR'd his press last week with three by five. Three by five, not one rep, but three by five. He lifetime squatted PR and deadlift PR and bench press PR'd last week. And so, and we have used pretty much nothing but barbell movements or some progression of a barbell movement with him. This guy came to the starting strength meet in the spring at Wichita Falls. His name's Craig Bickley. He's six seven. He's one of my patients and a friend of mine. And um, the doctor told him never lift, never squat again. He PR'd all three of his lifts at the strength meet, and we've done it strictly with nothing but barbell training. This is him in his garage training and. That's me looking up his nose. That's a big dude, man. So here are some methods to introduce the starting strength barbell method in the clinic. Um, start with movements that patients, and you could use this with your clients, things that they can relate to. I call squats sit to stands with my older population. Hey, we're gonna go sit to stand. Now I want you to lean way forward, drive your knees out, stand up. Look at that, see how easy that is? All right, let's do some more sit to stands. Now we're gonna put something in, your, in front of you or we're gonna put something on your back and how's that feel? Great, before you know it, we have them under the barbell. Um, I call deadlifts hip hinging. Hey, let's, let's pick something up off the floor, let's hip hinge. So we hip hinge them and then before you know it, they're lifting the barbell. So do something that's relatable to them. The second thing is schedule patients of dip or schedule clients of differing levels so that that are similar populations though. So if you have a 70 year old male that's using starting strength and a 70 year old male that's not or just starting schedule them together so that they can see potential and capacity. Teach them the value of the starting strength barbell method. Familiarize the patient with the barbells equipment that they can use and having it in your clinic or in your in your environment. It's in a gym obviously. And then translate these movements to other life movements. So here's what I'm going to say to you guys. If you guys are not marketing to a local PT clinic, I think you're losing business. And now I know that's a touchy subject because we like to talk bad about PTs and I talk bad about most of them too. But I think there's an opportunity for us to market to some of these guys. Number one, take time to meet a local PT in your area. Express your interest in wanting to co-refer. But first, talk to them about their treatment philosophy. Hey, how would you rehab this? How would you rehab this? Find out if that's gonna be near consistent. It doesn't have to be perfect, but kind of consistent with what your philosophy would be if you were to work with that client. Next thing is understand that barbell training one-on-one -on -one, or even in their clinic, it's not even part of their revenue scheme. They, they don't want the business. They say they want to be experts in strength, but they can't make a living doing it in a traditional physical therapy clinic. So it's business that you could be picking up. They're not going to take their patient that's exiting from insurance, which is going to be like that, right? How long they get to treat them. They're not going to take that patient and then transition them to a one-on-one -on -one training client. They, you know, they're seeing patients all day long. They don't want to do that. That's business you could get. Show them examples of clients that you've worked with. Maybe if you've got your iPad or something like that, show them examples of all different client levels of people you've developed strength with. And also talk to them about the fact that you're not doing rehab or treatment, you're into training. You realize, hey, I know, hey, I know you're a PT, I know you're the expert in treatment, but I'm really good at training people. So when, when you get done with them, how, what would you think about co-referring? I'll work with you, you work with me. If they say no, great, move on to the next one, right? Move on to the next person. And the last thing is develop a friendship with them. Show them that you want to learn from them because whether you realize it or not, they know some things academically and maybe experientially that you don't know and vice versa. There are some things that you know that they don't know. So learn from them and teach them what you know. And lastly, if you're going to do, use the barbell in the clinic, you have to have a therapy dog. 
Now this dog is not quite as big as Rip's dogs. He's 30 pounds of, but I mean, he's got a body fat of 2%, but uh, you gotta have a therapy dog that lifts. So that's Dozer. He is actually a certified therapy dog and that's him with one of my, um, that's actually a uh, shoulder replacement patient. So. Hey, watch it, man. That's a French bulldog. That's a French bulldog. Yeah. Bigger. Well, well, he lifts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, dang. that dude. I, I give him some uh, some uh, sports performance stuff too. So, <laughs> hey, he's got a lift, you know. But that's Dozer. But um, all right. Yeah. Questions? I'm good. So, in your experience with the client who had a herniated disc and couldn't deadlift but could squat. What do you think was the significant difference in loading of the spine that gave him no referred pain during the squat and had some referred pain in the deadlift at first? Because I had the same experience with somebody with a slip lumbar disc and referred pain, and I, we, we had to modify the deadlift a bit, and now he's able to deadlift. I wasn't sure why it was that the squat was fine and the deadlift would be more likely to produce referred pain. The only thing that I can think of is, is the compression and loading on that particular nerve root or where that disc herniation was or is. It, it determines kind of how that disc is going to act from a viscoelastic standpoint. In other words, how that disc is going to compress and where that herniation is going to go is all dependent upon the load, the moment arm, how hard the back musculature are contracting. And I think I had the same experience as a fusion patient. And even before that, I had the same experience. I could squat before I could deadlift. And Rip and I talked about it, and, and he told me, pull your deadlifts from the rack as singles. And I started with that, and then gradually I worked my way up. But I also high bar back squatted before I low bar, mm -hmm. just because I couldn't, I couldn't get that horizontal, and that just worked for me best. But I, I think it's the mechanics of the compression and loading. So now what I do with all my patients is I make them s squat first. And I learned this when I was in the hospital coming out of surgery. I had four back surgeries in the same calendar year with the fusion being the last one. Mm -hmm. I, st I got up out of the bed for the first time after my fusion and I could not even lean forward because it turned my back muscles on so much. And it came to me as a therapist of 26 years experience that wow, when you stand up, your back muscles fire a lot. So I thought, why don't I just have them squat, sit to stand, but I felt it then. And so that's what I ended up doing with them. So I, I squat them first, I deadlift them second. Good point. So you're set. <clears throat> Take it down eccentrically, come back up. And a deadlift starts at the concentric, and you just got to yeah. start by concentrically assuming a perfect position. And it's easier to start. Eating. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Good point. I, I think it's all mechanics and where that disc herniation is. For him, that worked well. Mm -hmm. If I have someone with a disc herniation that's another location, I might have to flip it. So I, I don't. I kind of prejudge it, but I let the movements tell me what we're going to do next. Cool. Thank you, sir. You bet. Anybody else? Can you give a, a real quick overview of the ring press, just how you do it? Well, I do it a little differently. I, I do use Rip's method, but in the ring press, when we use it with some of my patients, like that total shoulder, I, ha I had her walking away from the rings. I let the straps basically raise it up. So as she was walking away from the rings and the straps were raising it up, we start with PVC. I, I let her go into as much stretch as she could tolerate without pain. If she, if she had a lot of pain and she had ab an abnormal movement pattern, you know, she was really hiking, the sh substituting with the scapular area, then I made her back off in range of motion. But then I work it just like Rip, Rip talks about using it. I work from the top down. I have them start pressing at the top and then I work my way down, and then I gradually add load over time. I put a barbell in there. And, and once they can use the 12 and a half pound bar, I get rid of it. I, mean, I just get rid of the rings, period. So we just progress to presses. I'll just say, I, I think, um, <laughs> you know, this group has challenged me more than anything I've done in my professional career. And I've learned more from this group, several coaches in here that I, con I contact Nick regularly just to coach me up and say, hey, you need to do this or that. But one of the things I've learned about this is that I, I think there's a great opportunity for you as a coach. And if you hear nothing else, if you'll work with local PTs in your market, I think there's some smart PTs out there that would like to learn this stuff. But you've got to be careful about how you approach it, right? It's all about people skills. It's all about relationships. You're going to have some people 
that it's just barren ground. Forget it. Strength coaches at high schools, waste, tr- of, waste of time, you know. Um, so, you know, and I'll share one other story real quick about that. I have a client, I didn't have a picture of him, but I have a client that started with me in December. He had torn his hamstring four times, same location. Came to me, I got him as a pass off from another therapist. I started treating him. First thing I said to him was, you're not lifting, we gotta load you immediately. So we loaded him in a deadlift and a squat. We started, we also worked on the press. He left the clinic in about two weeks and then his dad contacted me and said, hey, we want you to train him. We know you're a strength coach, we want you to train him. I said, great. December 1st, we were doing back squats at 225. We were deadlifting 275, that was our start. End of February, now his brother plays for UNC, Division I as a defensive back. He had an offer to come to UNC, but he had to go to a JUCO first. So he came to me by the end of February. He squatted, he squatted 405 for five, and he deadlifted 475 for five. And he got that offer, so he went to UNC. But it's a great example of a guy that, and he hasn't torn his hamstring <laughs> again. That's the key, you know. So, but he just needed the right influence. And I think what we've got to offer is huge. But work with your local providers, get in that community, and learn from them. And I guarantee you, they'll learn from you too eventually. So, that's it.